Huawei's breakthrough chip. What is it? Why is it a big deal? And what should America do about it? Also, China's growing market share and lagging edge, its dominant EV sector, and what this means for the rest of the world's automotive industry. To discuss, I have on the great Dylan Patel of Semi Analysis, the equally great Doug O'Loughlin of Fabricated Knowledge. To start off, what is the Kirin 9000 chip and why is it so impressive? The Kirin 9000 chip is Huawei's newest smartphone chip. Uh, on the surface, it's not really that big of a deal, right? It doesn't break any of the benchmarks. It's not really for anything that's strategically important, right? It's just a smartphone chip. Uh, but when you dig a little bit deeper, it's actually an amazing breakthrough, right? So it, it goes from multiple angles, all the way from design to manufacturing. So on the design standpoint, Huawei designed a 5G modem, which they've done in the past, right? They had the best 5G modem before the bands came down a few years ago. Uh, furthermore, it has a custom CPU has a custom GPU, right? This is pretty impressive because Huawei didn't have a custom CPU and GPU in the past, but now they do, um, showing that they've, you know, not only retained their design chops after US sanctions, they've in fact increased them. Uh, the manufacturing is on SMIX N plus two process technology. And uh, SMIC for some reason has stopped naming their process technologies, uh, instead just calls it N plus one, N plus two, uh, N being 14 nanometer, N plus one being about 10 nanometer, and N plus two being seven nanometer, right? Uh, more or less in terms of, you know, the process geometries. And so this is very, this is a very big deal because, you know, China now has a domestic seven nanometer process technology. Um, and it's, it's in a, and it's in a real product, right? The prior sort of demonstration last year was N plus one for, first of all, and it was a Bitcoin mining chip. So kind of not really uh, a broad range of IPs, uh, but this, this being, seven nanometer and a smartphone chip, which kind of has every kind of IP possible, right? It has a cellular modem, has AI IP from the neural processing engine, has image signal processing. Um, it has, you know, various, uh, you know, CPU, GPU, all storage, media encoding, all this sort of stuff is on a smartphone SOC. So they've demonstrated a whole host of IP on a leading edge process technology that's sort of on par with the best of what Intel is still shipping today, right? Uh, which is what America has, right? Like, Intel's best process technology that I can go out and buy today is an Intel 7. And what's the best process technology from China that I can buy today? It is a SMIC 7. So, you know, while, while Intel, you know, is supposed to be releasing, you know, chips with laptops coming this year with their four, um, you know, 7 is what both America and China are on today. It's on par. And just to be clear, these are from two companies, Huawei and SMIC, that are um, on the entity list. So it's not just that you're sort of faced with the October 7th um, uh, regulations, but you have to go above and beyond and um, as a, a company on the analyst, like apply for licenses every time you like basically want to do anything with a um, uh, um, with an American company. Those uh, licenses Dylan, are practically ir irrelevant, right? Because one, you know, there's a whole sh host of shell companies that you can spawn. I mean, if you talk to Lamb Research and you ask them like, hey, what's the sustainability of of lagging edge semiconductor equipment demand, Lam Research being an equipment company for manufacturing semiconductors, right? They they'll tell you, oh yeah, it's it's great. I mean, yeah, there's some companies that have been put on the entity list, but there's ten new companies, uh, you know, that that came out and they're building fabs, and it's like, oh come on, I mean, some of them are new companies building fabs, right? Like for sure, but some of them are just being routed to SMIC, right? And and in some yeah. cases, they're just being granted licenses too to ship to SMIC. Uh, so it's so you know the entity list uh, licensing, all this sort of you know, if licenses are handed out like candy and, and the entity list is not really bulletproof, uh, then, you know, I don't really see how that's relevant. And, and let's not forget, too, I, I want to make two points before we continue. The the tools that work for the lag, lagging edge can often be used for the leading edge. The thing that we have obviously clamped down the hardest on is EUV. Uh, no EV sh tools are shipped into China, but like, for example, a metals deposition tool that can be, you know, that's being used for high or bigger pitches can also be used for lower level pitches. Like the, the line there is extremely gray. And I don't think that um, the, the export controls really consider the fact that a lot of these lagging edge tools can mostly be used on the leading edge, right? The precision is not exactly uh, constrained on anything other than the, the pattern, meaning the, the lithography. The lithography is what defines the pitches, but all the tools can probably work um, with that level of uh, precision. So there's kind of like this giant loophole in the fact that most of the tools that are being sold to quote unquote the lagging edge can obviously be used on the leading edge. And also people maybe have underestimated or underappreciated the Kirin SMIC chip because this 
this seven nanometer technology density and performance is pretty on par with Intel. And Intel is like, this was the, this was the node that Intel missed for like how many years in a row, Dylan, like five years or something like that. This was originally Intel 10 that has been renamed to Intel seven. So you're telling me that like this, the, the giant hiccup that Intel missed over and over on is pretty much what Smith managed to completely nail with, um, with obviously a lot harder aspects of technology, like, you know, the technology has been restricted from them. I think that the just the competitive dynamic there is really underappreciated because, you know, they, they managed to pull off what, a, what Intel could not, um, with more restrictions and in a shorter time frame. Although I would, I would argue that they have no, not, no equipment is restricted, uh, that wasn't used in Intel's, you know, 10 nanometer slash seven, uh, nanometer process node, right? Like Intel seven uses the NXT, NXE 1980i, which is a specific lithography tool from ASML. That tool is not restricted from being shipped into China. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the question of like, hey, are they restricted? Well, if I can get any tool I want from any from just a random shell company in China or just get it shipped to me because licenses are can't handed out like candy, what is the what am I being restricted on even? Right. Uh, you know, there are there are restrictions around EDA, which is a software for helping design chips. But that only applies to three nanometer chips. Right. Not not seven nanometer chips. So, again, there's yeah. nothing being restricted. Um, you know, th there's there's restrictions around a whole host of things, but none of it applies to what SMIC and Huawei are doing, even though the the regulation, the October 7th regulation was very clear in saying no company should be, you know, should be using assisting Chinese companies with below 14 nanometer using American technology. And yet at the same time, they're all doing it because there's, you know, massive loopholes in the regulation. This is one of your sort of spicier claims in your recent post on semi-analysis, the fact that, um, you know, this is being done with the sort of like blindfold negligence or, um, uh, uh, you know, active uh, support of all these uh, foreign players in the U.S., Japan. Uh, you know, Germany, uh, and and so on. So, like, is it plausible that, you know, the KLAs and um, Tokyo Electrons of the world, like, would not know what their machines are being used for? I mean, don't they need sort of, like, um, uh, sort of ongoing support? And, like, you'll go into the fab and look at it and fix it and, like, understand, you know, what are the wafers that are coming out on the other side? Are we talking about EGS in terms of, like, applied global services is, like, this giant services arm that essentially uh is one of the big semi caps and yes a lot of things is like you buy this tool but you buy this tool off the shelf and clearly like you know most you know the process engineer there's definitely some process engineers you know know what's going on but you get the latest and greatest and you're gonna have to do a lot of co-work with uh with the tool company and that's where ags which is the largest service company uh applied service uh comes in and so they come in and they help you uh figure out how to use your tool for the best op application continual maintenance yeah. for the tools um, you know, constant spares. upgrades, spares, uh, make sure yeah. your uptime is very high. And, and basically you can't sell a tool without, you know, so applied materials pretty much attaches a global, a, a, uh, an AGS service contract with most of the tools they service and they sell. Um, and, and so, and this is like, you know, they, they brag about how, 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 how high the attach rate is, um, and, and how, how it helps their customers well, and how it's so profitable for them. Right. And and yeah, at the same time, they're, they're they're doing this in China, so like, yeah, they should they should be seeing this, but I don't know. Maybe it's you know never attribute uh, malice uh, when ignorance is possible. So maybe maybe it's yeah. just ignorance. But uh, in many cases, you know exactly what the tool is doing. Like, hey, well, hey, we're having problems depositing this uh, thirty six nanometer uh, copper uh, you know metal uh, you know line. What, what what's going on? Can you help us tune tune the tool? It's like, well, thirty six nanometers is uh, copper metal line is, is what TSMC seven nanometer uses, right? There's no, there's no 14 nanometer that uses 36 nanometer, uh, copper, copper lines. Right. Um, so, so, you know, they should be able to tell, uh, but you know, maybe yeah. it's just malice. Maybe it's ignorance. Yeah. Maybe they're just answering, you know, whoever's working on it, or for example, applied might have, uh, a domestic Chinese service for us, which, uh, does all the servicing. Right. And then, you know, they interact or they work with the global AGS, right. They were like, Oh, what's this question? I don't know. There, there. It's really hard to know because there's thousands of steps in making a semiconductor. Um, and and like part of this is also like I think ASML is like weirdly, we'll say negligent here. For example, like the reason why the 1980, like the DV tools, I think is really interesting as a as a concept, right? Like 1980 is is 
The difference between a 1980 and a 2000i or whatever is essentially some overlay tools. But my question is like, if ASML is selling services spares uh, retrogrades, can they not uh, retrograde the 1980 tool with a better overlay tool? Or if there's like not an entire industry devoted in China to improving overlay um, in DUV, I, it just seems like an obvious loophole or like there's been so many obvious loopholes that you could drive, you could drive a bus through and uh, people have just kind of been watching, waiting. And then, you know, 12 months later, you're like, oh, SMIC 7, how did this possibly happen? It's like, well, we gave them many loopholes. There is absolutely no way that uh, China today could be making 7 nanometer, could be making 14 nanometer, could even be making 28 nanometer without Western tooling equipment and support. Um, and I think this was sort of illustrated really dramatically um, but just with you guys sort of walking around Semicon. Like every single one of the, you know, there must have been like 600 companies there. And every single one of them in some way, shape or form is involved in effect. And, you know, that's why they're there. They're real companies. You know, some are large, some are small, but they're sort of like in this ecosystem. And like the amount of domestic Chinese players were like really a pretty small percentage, basically four. And, and, and you know, they, none of them are, are, are sort of proffering like, you know, end to end solutions. For uh, for manufacturing uh, 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 sort of lagging edge semiconductors, much less something like a um, like a like a fourteen or a or a seven nanometer. So um, you know the fact that these chips are coming out at all in scale uh, means that there is a ton of sort of um, you know uh, global uh, sort of you know, ex Chinese support, which is going into uh, enabling the production and, and and yield. Yeah, I mean. You talk to the domestic Chinese players, um, pretty much they have only ever been able to carve out extremely small parts of, uh, only really small parts of the process if it's leading edge, or they, they carve out much older lagging edge, which with much lower precision. For example, SME, the, comp the Chinese lithography company, essentially has nothing to do with lithography in the way that we think about it. Most of the lithography that's happening there is for advanced packaging and printing lith litho patterns onto a PCB. Very different precision, very different product, you know? So really for the most part, yes, it's a, I would think the other part that maybe is underappreciated here is that there is a lot of Japanese and Korean firms. And that might be the, um, the kind of the way that you can get around this as well to a certain extent. For example, Tokyo Electron does have a lot of N10 solutions and Tokyo Electron um, often can't compete with Applied uh, on a head-to-head -head basis for most of the tools. There, there are many times they're number two and number three but they do have a full solution. So that's one of the ways that they can be getting tools. Um, another big thing is that like Korean tool companies, which are often mostly kind of memory captive, uh, those are some incremental ways. But but at the end of the day, thousand steps in making a semiconductor and uh, America, uh, the American semiconductor companies really are four of the big five company, or I guess three of the big five companies and they really, at the end of the day, um, drive a lot of the boat, especially like the random steps, right? Lithography is ASML, uh, Tokyo is cleaning, but everything else in the, in the middle oftentimes comes to the American semiconductor. So yeah, clearly there's American help. And, and the sort of import substitution strategy is like a multi-decadal one. Like, it, like if, you take, if you take the sort of pieces of the Jenga puzzle out, like you will not find other pieces of that, uh, you know, however much you want to spend, however much industrial espionage you want to do, this is like a extremely difficult, um, if not like probably impossible thing for um, the the sort of like Chinese, you know, broader ecosystem to be able to to, to replicate domestically, even with the help of, um, you know, Japanese and Korean firms. I, I like that analogy a lot because essentially what you're doing is you're giving them a puzzle. You're taking one piece out and saying you're not allowed to have that one piece of the puzzle. It's like, OK, well, we can make that piece of the puzzle. Right. Um, and it'll look exactly like the original. Right. Puzzle. Um, but if you take out. 100 pieces of the puzzle, right? And it's a 200 piece puzzle, then that's impossible, right? It takes way too much engineering, way too much time, way too much capital. But if there's just a few pieces taken out, which is what's happened today, right? Then then the puzzle can be completed. Uh, the investment is large, but it's not insurmountable. And the cost of doing it is not insurmountable. And, and also we could like the proof is in the pudding. You should like, there has been some really good charts of uh, American exports into China, China for semi-cap. Uh, the chart has gone parabolic essentially. Uh, year to date, it is this. It is the single biggest difference between um, what we thought WFE, meaning wafer fab equipment, would be year to date, and what it actually has ended up being has been just semi cap demand tool. Uh, demand has just been like truly it 
an exponential. It's, it's at the highest on a monthly basis it's ever been. Um, and there is no way, like I know they're making a lot of lagging edge fabs, but there is 0% chance that some of like a meaningful amount of those tools are not being used for SMIC 7. So I would po point out is that applied materials sort of like they, they have this entire business unit called ICAPS, right? And that's for this trailing edge stuff, right? Uh, IoT, communication, sensors, all this sort of stuff like that. Um, and, and that business unit has basically bailed out the rest of the company as uh, the world economy has slowed, right? You know, people have cut back. TSMC cut $4 billion of spending this year from what their original plan was. Uh, Intel cut a little bit silently, you know, um, you know, Samsung cut, right? You know, these major, you know, non-Chinese companies cut. But hey, actually, Applied Materials is doing quite well because of this ICAPS business unit. Now, some of that is going internationally, uh, you know, to not just and, and the U.S., but a big, a lot of that is, is China, right? And if you look at the percentage of sales, right, it's, 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 it's really um, very clear that this ICAPS business unit is shipping a ton of tools there. Um, and, and, you know, it's kind of like that jigsaw puzzle, right? We've taken out one piece uh, and, and they can clearly route them around. Uh, so we've established over the past 10 minutes the fact that sort of what, what SMIC has been able, what, what Huawei has been able to design and what SMIC has been able to fab um, is, you know, uh, you know, 14 nanometer was apparently the line that the Biden administration tried to set. Uh, we're now at seven and um, we're at seven uh, sort of scale with 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 pretty promising lead. So uh, yield. So um, Dylan, can you sort of talk us through the sort of data points that you used to came to that uh, conclusion that this isn't just like a sort of one off thing, but this is actually something that they'll be able to um, uh, manufacture at scale and relatively economically? Sure. So, you know, any manufacturing process with, you know, tons of steps. Uh, maybe you can get one or two out right with 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 a lot of money thrown in, uh, and that's sort of been the argument that certain people who are you know you know pundits have been has been hey SMIC has really really bad yield right um, and and I don't doubt they have worse yield than TSMC Samsung Intel uh, they just got here right uh, you know that's how that's sort of how process technology works right you start with a very simple chip you know smartphone chips small smartphone chips right and then you move up and up and up until you finally have these massive you know data center you know scale ai chips uh you know G cpus that are you know used in data center servers right like you know sort of at the end right once your yield is really good um and so the the thing that pundits you know some pundits have been saying is that the yield is very low right um and i don't know if that's that's really the case right one like there was a there's a source that said uh you know the d0 um, and a very specific number, which is, uh, you know, about twice what TSMC has, uh, but TSMC is the gold standard, maybe a little Intel, but still is, behind, what right? Is D0? D0 is the number of defects you have per, uh, square centimeter. Um, and, and that's just like how many transistors don't work. Um, you know, so, so sort of that metric was leaked out, but you know, that's hearsay hard to, hard to like, uh, you know, say this is, this is good or bad. The other thing you can do is you can look at the sort of uh, reverse engineering, you know, analysis that Tech Insights has done, right? Tech Insights uh, purchased the chip, uh, tore it down, you know, looked at it under scanning electron microscope, looked at every feature that they could, you know, so on and so forth. And, and you know, if you look at the structures, right, and this is more of, you know, this is, again, like more of a qualitative thing, uh, the sort of variation, how the various metal uh, layers look, how the transistor looks is not horrible, right? Uh, you know, when you have bad yield, you know, your, your, your metal layers might be more wavy, right? But they're not wavy. They look pretty straight, right? Like, and this is qualitative, right? Um, you know, the, the fin fets, you know, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty straight, right? You know, they're not super wavy, you know, the, they're, you know, there's not that many, there's not many shorts or con things like that that you can see. Um, that's, that's another sort of data point is if you look at the teardown analysis and you know what you're looking for. Um, and then the last sort of data point, again, this is a bit more qualitative because the empirical testing is still, you know, the, people have been posting benchmarks. Um, a lot of people have posted benchmarks, right? I mean, like this is the hottest phone in the world to post a benchmark on, right? Even hotter than like the new iPhone release. Um, and so, you know, ev everyone's posting these benchmarks all over the place. And the interesting thing is uh, when, when chips have low yields, right? So for example, this happened uh, just a year and a half ago. Uh, you know, T Qualcomm uh, switched from TSMC to Samsung uh, for their, or they, they switched to a new Samsung process node, sorry. Um, you know, Samsung 4. Um, for their S8 G1 chip, uh, smartphone chip. And it was a brand new process node from Samsung. It was difficult for them to do. And the yield wasn't good, right? That was reported by many outlets. Um, and then once the chip came out, you know, if you tested a phone, you tested another phone, you can see a variation as much as 10% between two phones <laughs> with the exact same chip, 
And why is that, right? Like, yes, there's the there's a couple aspects of yield, right? Yield can be, hey, it doesn't work at all, right? Like, hey, this transistor doesn't work. Hey, this contact shorted itself. Hey, this metal layer bridges to another metal layer. It just doesn't work, right? But then there's another aspect of like, hey, you look at the features, you know, they're wavy, right? You know, oh, well, that increases resistance slightly. Uh, you know, that, that, that reduces the switching time for, for a transistor or increases it, sorry. Um, so you can end up with like this, what's called parametric yield, right? Which is, hey, the chip still works, but how many actually reach the targets, right? Hey, can it reach this frequency at X power? Um, can, you know, that, that's sort of this idea of parametric yield. And so, you know, that's, that's really where most yield losses go to in the semiconductor manufacturing industry, right? It's not, hey, the chip doesn't work at all. It's like, hey, well, it works, but like, a handful of transistors switch at really, you know, they, they can't they can't switch fast. So, you know, the, the clock speeds are limited way below what we actually want them to be. Um, or, you know, the you know, something's wrong with the metal layers or something like that, right? Like, you know, you can't get the par- parameters you want out of the chip. Um, and so when 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 you have bad yield, a lot of times you you do what's called binning. I mean, well, you do binning anyways, right? Which is you take chips that you've manufactured, you test them all and you say, hey, some are some are the best, right? These are great. These, some are good. Some are okay, some are bad, right? And then you set, and, and, and it's a far more complicated process than that. But then you set a line. You're like, hey, well, you know, for the chip, we'll accept great and good, right? Or, or maybe we'll make great an i7 and we'll make good an i5, right? If you're talking Intel CPUs, right? Um, but you'll set a line and that's where you define the product. And, and the interesting thing is if you have bad yield, generally your, your product is, uh, varies a lot more, right? And this even applies to like, i5s, uh, you know, Intel's first 10 nanometer i5 laptop CPUs, there was a lot of variance, right? So, you know, that, that Qualcomm chip that I was referring to earlier, there's a lot of variance. The benchmarks that I've seen online, and there needs to be a lot more testing done, there doesn't seem to be a ton of device to device variation, which, which implies that their parametric yield is actually pretty good, right? Um, which would imply their real yield is good, right? Uh, now, now, all of these are like soft, but, you know, I, 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 re- I, I don't believe for a moment that this chip has 10% yield, like some pundits who are trying to downplay the significance of it. Um, you know, the actual number is probably going to, you know, be higher than that, but, you know, no clue, but I don't think it's low. So to recap, we have Huawei designing and then SMIC manufacturing a seven nanometer smartphone chip, at like, you know, halfway decent to probably pretty good yield. Um, and in a way that they'll be able to sort of scale it up and make lots and lots and lots of phones. Um, but again, as you led with Dylan, like phones, people aren't particularly stressed about, but, um, sort of AI hardware accelerators, uh, was one of the two things that, uh, uh, the, the, uh, commerce department on October 7th of last year decided was too scary for sort of like military reasons to, uh, allow, uh, sort of unfettered importing from China of, the latest and greatest uh, AI hardware accelerators. So, um, given what we've seen out of uh, Huawei and SMIC, what does that what does that imply for China's ability to manufacture? You know, the rough equivalent of what Nvidia can do at TSMC today. The the way sm- uh, manufacturing always progresses, you start with a smartphone chip and then you move up, right? Apple's always the first to a new TSMC process node. In fact, back in the day, uh, 2019, first EUV node ever. It was a Huawei design chip, you know, just just want to point that out. First five nanometer chip to be released was a Huawei chip. One month later, Apple came with their chip, you know, so it's more of a technicality. But, you know, Huawei is right up there on the design uh, standpoint. What happens after you design that that chip, right? Well, Huawei would often, you know, after the smartphone would start designing uh, some of their telecom chips, right, uh, for 5G. Um, you know, that's what they were doing back in, you know, 1920. And that's that or not start designing, but start manufacturing those after the smartphone kind of ramp. And the yields got better there. Then you make a bigger chip where yields are, again, a little bit lower because it's a bigger chip. It's harder to manufacture and yields improve. And then you make a giant chip. Right. Um, And so, you know, at least for NVIDIA, they come on to, you know, a TSMC process technology maybe two years after uh, Apple will. Right. So for their AI chips, their massive AI chips that are, you know, taking the world by a storm. Um, and, And for these chips, uh, you know, you need you need pretty good yields, of course. But the capacity is also important. Um, and the interesting thing there is that, hey, um, you know, capacity doesn't seem to be the biggest limitation for SMIC, uh, given they can still import all the tools necessary. Uh, ASML is increasing the number of uh, DUV lithography tools they're manufacturing by a factor of two. Uh, many of those are intended for China, uh, you know, um, and, and the re- numbers required are not insurmountable for China to import. In fact, I think they'll have enough to do 
30,000 wafers a month at SMIC, uh, you know, by, but by the middle or end of next year. Right. Um, and, and that's without, you know, re, re, uh, you know, taking away lithography tools from their other fabs. Um, so, so they'll have enough tools, n- not just on lithography, but other process steps to achieve 30,000 wafers a month. Now, what does that actually mean? Right. Um, so, so just for context, right. Apple ships 250 million iPhones, right. A year, roughly. Um, and 250 I- million iPhones equates to 250 million application processors. Now, there's a lot of other semiconductors, but specifically the leading edge semiconductor is the application processor and the modem. Um, and and for Apple, you know, based on their chip size for the application processor, they get about 500 to 600 chips per wafer, right? So 30,000 wafers is almost enough to do their entire demand, right? Is almost enough to to satisfy all of Apple's demand, um, you know. Uh, the demand is more like 40, 40,000, right? Once you account for yield and all that, right? Uh, so for, for just the application processor. Now, Huawei is integrating the modem, so they don't need separate uh, capacity for the modem, but it makes their chip slightly larger. Anyways, you know, this is, this is already, you know, potentially as much as Apple's demand for application processors on the leading edge. Now, when you look at NVIDIA, um, you know, similar story happens, right? Uh, NVIDIA has a demand. It's not anywhere near as large as Apple, right? Because they sell a very large chip at very high margins, right? Whereas Apple sells a very small chip, you know, at okay margins, right? As a company, um, you know, their margins are only like 50% or something like that. Uh, whereas NVIDIA's are like 80% on these data center chip. Anyways, if you had 50% yield with 30,000 wafers a month, um, you could produce, you know, at, over, over the course of 12 months, you could produce uh, 10 million chips that are, large die format, right? Working chips, if your yield is 50%. Um, that, is, that is a huge, huge number, right? For reference, um, and, 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 you know, the, the, the leading edge chip, right? The five nanometer, the seven nanometer chip is, you know, only a component of the AI system, uh, but it's the most difficult to produce component. Um, OpenAI trained GPT-4 with about 24,000 GPUs, right? Um, 24,000 GPUs is 24,000, you know, of those dies plus, you know, the memory and, and interconnects and all of that, which are maybe not as limited, right? The big limit limited part is that very advanced uh, leading edge processor. So if they were able to train GPT-4 with 24,000 chips, right? Now inference, you know, like actually running the model and serving it to users requires even more chip. But, you know, if they're able to train it with that many chips, uh, China, China already has that, right? China can already do that with how many chips they've imported and are importing from a- a- NVIDIA today. Uh, but furthermore, as you, as you step forward, it's like, well, yeah, NVIDIA is ramping their capacity like crazy. You know, people are talking about, you know, as much as $70 billion worth of NVIDIA data center GPUs next year. Um, that, that, that could be satisfied by 30,000 wafers a month, right, uh, from TSMC at 5 nanometer. Now, if SMIC, SMIC is on 7 nanometer and has that total capacity, can they, they can, they, they'll be a little bit behind NVIDIA, but, you know, NVIDIA is splitting their capacity across the world, whereas China is one country uh, and very focused. Okay, so let's 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 uh, just just clar- clarify for folks. So um, the like, are there technical challenges once you can make a you know a, a Huawei level seven seven nanometer smartphone chip at scale? Going from that to making you know your your BRAN or your Huawei um, AI hardware accelerator, like it like is there any actual roadblock given the tools that uh, you know Smith clearly already has available? I don't think so. Uh, so like the best, the best compare, like the comparison, probably in terms of feature parity, A100 was seven nanometer. I'm assuming they're going to be able to smart enough to figure out some of the networking aspects that would probably make it a little bit better than A100. Uh, assuming this is all seven nanometer, not even assuming that, you know, SMIC makes it to five. Um, I think the, the other things that come that might make things problematic is uh, hardware or no, sorry, software. Um, so for example, all the AI, uh, the AI stack that is uh, available to make, to train these models is very, uh, very NVIDIA focused, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, making an entire software stack to support this, this, you know, you know, this Byron, a 100, uh, you know, a 100, H 100 equivalent, uh, probably a lot of work, but at the same time, there's also a lot of open source libraries for, for training this stuff. PyTorch is mostly open source, for example. Um, so, 
And there's obviously focus and will. And the only thing is they only have to do it once, if that makes sense, instead of the United States is split. You know, we're talking about splitting the capacity. Uh, everyone is also splitting their roadmaps in different ways to do it. Like Google has an idea. Uh, you know, Meta has an idea. Uh, Microsoft has an idea of how they're doing this. And obviously some are buying uh, NVIDIA, some are not. China is probably only going to have to do it once. And um, frankly, I would think the process side of it uh, is probably more cap like you know at least intensive uh on a relative basis than than the software side of sticking up a stack one time to make an extremely large language model work so um i think it's gonna be really you know there there are obviously other headwinds and, and problems i think networking is some a place that i don't really understand uh where their leading edge capacity is at, quite at like you know do they have 800G DSPs, probably not, but like they are already the largest producer of, you know, or largest packager of 800D DSP. So it's like, I'm sure they can figure out some kind of way. Um, overall, uh, if they've done the SMIC, if they've done the SMIC uh, hurdle, I think they can definitely do this, the software hurdle. And we should probably see something like, like a beer in whatever, A100 in the next coming months, in, including eventually what will be a software stack as well. So that's what I think. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, a lot of these other chips that are required for AI systems besides the compute are not restricted at all, right? High bandwidth memory, uh, which is a 3D stacked memory, extremely complicated, is not limited. These DSPs that Doug was referring to, not limited. Uh, these optics for 800G transceivers, not limited, right? These these 51.2T switches, not limited, right? Like the, you can ship as many of those as you want into China. You don't need a license. There's no, there's no, there's no restrictions at all. So you know, uh, the the one thing that is restricted is clearly, uh, you know, capable of being produced. You know, very soon. Uh, you know, maybe a year from now, maybe two years from now. Um, but everything else is not not restricted in any way at all. Before we go into the potential ways that the the U.S. government could. Uh, you know, escalate when it comes to the export controls and, and, and make them tighter. I want to come back to sort of the original justification from from BIS. So um, uh, just sort of a, a little reading for you guys. In the rollout to the October 7th restrictions, the Commerce Department laid out the justification for cutting off foreign support for, uh, you know, these advanced logic uh, uh, memory and then AI chips. The, the, the line was... Um, uh, the restrictions implemented in this rule follow extensive U.S. government consideration of the impact of advanced computing ICs, supercomputers, and semiconductor manufacturing equipment, enabling military modernization, including the development of weapons of mass destruction and human rights abuses. So the sort of, um, you know, we've talked over the past, uh, the past half an hour about pretty much the Chinese government and, um, you know, its leading uh, companies have been able to uh, sort of surpass the line in the sand that the U.S. government has tried um, has tried to draw when it comes to 14 nanometer, um, and so then the and and you know like there's this big debate as to whether or not the um, uh, you know the justification of this was for to like you know uh, sort of strictly national security thing national security reasons, which is what the um, document uh, you know the document and all the rhetoric over the past um, few years from the Biden administration has been talking about about look it's a small yard high fence like we're only trying to stop china from upgrading it's um uh, you know upgrading the pla and changing the sort of military balance of power in east asia um or as some argue you know it, this is like a like a, a sort of economic security push that you know we're sort of worried that the same thing that happened to semiconductors uh you know the same thing that happened with solar panels might happen with semiconductors and all of a sudden we could be living in the world where like china is manufacturing better than everyone else uh, at more scale than everyone else and sort of the world all of a, all of a sudden becomes dependent on um on semiconductor taking the sort of like narrowest view of uh what the goalpost the biden administration set for itself as in like slowing the chinese slowing chinese uh semiconductor development down to the point where um you know uh, the us and the rest of the world is not helping um, uh, Chinese firms, uh, you know, push past 14 nanometer and get to the point where, um, you know, it's able to start a start, you know, significantly eating market share from the TSMC, Samsung's and Intel's of the world when it comes to manufacturing this stuff. Um, you know, it's unclear whether the level at which the interim rules on October 7th were set, um, are going to be able to, to, to sort of execute on that. So, um, you know, the, the big question I kind of have um, is, you know, which side, uh, 
the U.S. should err on. Because, you know, this is this is an art, not a science. This is an incredibly sort of like dynamic, complex uh, ecosystem you're trying to sort of regulate and get around. And like, you know, you're inevitably not going to hit exactly the, the sort of level of tightness or looseness that um, you're, you're, you're sort of you're sort of aiming for. So, you know, do you does like is is America the West? I mean, you know, not really the West is our America and it's sort of like high performing technology allies more broadly. Would they rather be in a world in which they were too tight or too loose? And, you know, the arguments for sort of um, being too tight is that, um, you know, potentially the U.S. would escalate U.S.-China um, tensions. I think that is kind of baked in at this point um, for longtime listeners of, uh, of China Talk. The, the October 7th export controls, you know, made the point as explicitly as, as you could. I'm not sure what you know, marginally more tighter, uh, marginally tighter export controls would, on semiconductors in particular would necessarily do. Um, you know, there was a concern a few years ago um, that, you know, the, the world had this huge lagging edge crunch and, you know, Chinese capacity would actually be a sort of net positive for the world and help to, um, uh, uh, you know, and help to alleviate a lot of the, um, uh, uh, the supply chain problems that the, um, uh, that the, uh, you know, planet had coming, uh, coming out of uh, COVID and, you know, with the um, a huge sort of boom cycle in the, in the early phase of the, uh, of the lockdown. Um, you know, on the too loose end, uh, we have these uh, scary like allusions to weapons of mass destruction and human rights abuses. Um, and then we, you know, potentially have a world in which, uh, you know, SMIC and uh, BREN and Huawei are 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 pushing, uh, you know, TSMC, Apple um, and NVIDIA out of their sort of premier place on the global uh, on the global supply chain where I sit today. Um, particularly after, you know, the new data point that we have of the Chinese, um, uh, the Chinese ecosystem with the access that they have really being able to, um, to, to play with the big boys um, is that I would rather be in a world in which uh, sort of uh, BIS is missing by being too tight as opposed to by being um, sort of too loose on this. Um, but I'm curious for sort of your guys' uh, your guys's take on that, on that, uh, on that broader question. We've been talking almost exclusively about the the Byron Smick, you know, like Huawei axis, right? But the thing that I think has become an emerging story here is the lagging edge in China. Um, kind of has this like really, really um, has this like really similar to history rhyme aspect of it, if that makes sense. Um, so let's not forget one of the reasons why we're here, where there's like so much dependence on Taiwan. Is the fact that uh, uh, American semiconductor companies kind of realized, hey, we could, you know, essentially uh, take out all the hard, you know, capital intensive stuff, human intensive stuff, and we'll just do all the, you know, all the high value stuff, and we'll we'll um, we'll outsource all the, you know, all the messy manufacturing. Um, and obviously, the problem is if you do that long enough, you eventually lose all the manufacturing know how. That's kind of how we got here. Um, I think that that same kind of story uh, can definitely repeat itself. And I think the place that is probably most interesting and it's most likely to repeat itself is right now electric vehicles in China. So electric vehicles in China, if you haven't seen year to date, um, they are exporting at an extremely increasing rate. They are already the most electrified country in the world. And they also have a lot of national champions that seem to be um, a lot competing in a, a different way compared to traditional OEMs. Um, the company I'm thinking of in particular is BYD. BYD has become probably the first vertically integrated uh, semiconductor and car company with the implication and battery company, to be clear, with the implication that um, by integrating all the high value uh, and high margin parts into the uh, that like go into a car, they can lower the cost of car, uh, essentially becoming a full stack IDM. Um, the thing that is interesting and the knock on effect is that if they do this and they become this fully integrated semiconductor car company, they will be able to compete at a price globally that no other car manufacturer in the world should be able to compete with. And then that really reminds me of the solar panel electric vehicle uh, like corollary, because one of the reasons why solar panel, the solar panel dumping was so intense in, in America whenever um, Chinese exporters came, uh, came here was that essentially they were, uh, they were doing something called price dumping, meaning that like the price that they were selling the product at was below the, the, uh, the, the cost of goods sold of a company. So how could you ever compete if you're like every time you sell a solar via, uh, solar panel at the same price as your competitor, you're losing money. Um, that same dynamic seems to be happening today. 
Uh, there's been a new line of cars, especially from BYD, that go as low as $10,000 on an electric vehicle. And BYD seems to be mildly profitable doing this. Meanwhile, I, I think even thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars 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 $50,000 EVs in the West um, are, profit, are, are essentially gross profit negative with the exception of Tesla. So this is like a really interesting story that I think creates like this long-term future push-pull with the West and, and China that I think is maybe underappreciated today. And if we fast forward it in five, 10 years, um, I think there'll be a real problem for Western car OEMs. Uh, so that's that's kind of like my my whole wrap on what I'm seeing on the lagging edge side of things that I think that maybe the market is, the market slash people who are in powerful places with policy decisions um, are, are maybe missing because it's, it's something that's been happening so quickly. Uh, BYD went from almost completely external PM, PMICs, which is power management ICs, to completely internal within the span of like two years. That kind of ramp is really, really quick. I think that the people are still kind of playing with the assumptions of maybe a year or two ago. Meanwhile, if you look forward, you can kind of put all the pieces together and you can see this huge cost advantage and this huge potential price dumping into foreign markets. Um, and what's interesting is I think European governments are finally figuring it out. I think this morning there was actually, uh, there was actually some kind of news where they're they're, they're like looking at the EV exports in, uh, with the thought process of subsidies, um, maybe maybe making the EV exporting kind of like a dumping thing. So this is an yeah. ongoing story that I think is going to be much bigger in the coming months. Uh, so we're recording this on the uh, September 13th and uh, Van der Leyen just said, you know, we're going to be looking at EVs and anti-dumping. But like the, 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 the thing I think, which is, you know, the fundamental point you get at, um, uh, Doug, is that like, it's not really any dumping because they have a different business model and they're sort of like vertically integrating in a way which um, European and American car and Japanese and Korean car manufacturers like haven't um, and don't necessarily have any plans to do on the horizon. And like, um, you know, subsidies don't have the price of a car. Um, uh, it's just like that's just not what we're seeing here. Um, and, you know, it's 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 sort of interesting because I think like the like the. Um, uh, you know, the, the AI accelerators uh, that are going to make supercomputers to sort of model ballistic missiles is is, is one thing. But like there, there's a more interesting discussion, I think, to be had um, when it comes to solar panels and uh, electric vehicles of like, what is the trade off we really want to make as a, as sort of countries around the world? Because like, you know, we will probably electrify faster. Um, well, we're certainly being able to sort of like green and electrify faster. Um, by being comfortable buying, um, you know, Chinese uh, photo, uh, photovoltaics. And, you know, the same thing is going to probably be the case for electric vehicles. But, um, you know, to what extent the, the U.S. seems to have made a decision that we're just not going to allow um, imports um, from China and the rest of the world, I think, is, you know, probably only Europe is the only other place that might um, sort of come to come to that sort of decision. But there's going to be a real um, sort of uh, 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 environmental as well as um, uh sort of economic cost to not allowing consumers to buy what um, what are the sort of cheapest and most like performant products. It's it's interesting. You know, we, we talk about, hey, yeah, it, they're totally going to be able to do AI. They're totally going to be able to do, uh, you know, propaganda AIs to try and deceive the Taiwanese population or, you know, radicalize the U.S. population. They're totally going to be able to do, uh, you know, AIs to help with battlefield planning and tactics, and they're totally going to be able to make radars that detect F-35s. But the economic impact is is also arguably just as important, right? What happens when a hundred billion dollars of European car exports uh, turn into hundred billion dollars of Chinese car exports, and the knock-on effects on the industry and and society, right? What happens when Huawei is now able to get back to shipping 190 million units of uh, their own smartphone chip? Right, which is what they were doing in 2019. Right, 190 million of their own smartphone chips. Uh, you know, what does that do to Apple? Well, that you know, they, they, Apple gained 30 to 35 million to 45 million, 35 to 45 million sales, which is roughly 20 billion dollars of iPhones. Right, what happens to you know Apple, the company? Well, they'll be fine, but you know, there's going to be knock-on effects in the supply chain. What's going to happen to MediaTek and Qualcomm when hey, that same you know 190 million units of uh, chips that they were shipping. Uh, that they then, uh, you know, gain share from, you know, it, it's $8 billion of revenue, right? Like for them, uh, you know, so the, the knock-on effects on the entire supply chain, even on things that we haven't deemed, you know, sort of quote unquote banned are, you know, something that people need to think about. But furthermore, right, like, the, you know, getting back to the point, you know, they're totally going to be able to do AI chips. 
uh, that are that are not maybe not competitive, but a year or two behind, uh, but with more focus, more software effort, right? Because they have more software engineers than the U.S., Europe, and uh, you know, Japan combined. Um, you know, the, the you know, it's it's it, it it becomes you know sort of a challenge. So so another thing which I think will be really interesting to watch, um, Dylan, as you've talked about the the sort of like. Uh, shifting uh the, the potential shifting like market dynamics of, of huawei being able to manufacture phones at scale is like the political economy domestically here in the u.s of who's now going to be in favor versus who is going to be against tighter export controls um because like i think before um you know you would have seen apple and uh qualcomm and broadcom be very much against sort of any sort of tech escalatory um thing you know obviously the semi cap manufacturers wanted wanted nothing to do with what wanted nothing to do this would do do with this but all of a sudden you, we are now going to have a sort of like uh you know a a player on the uh you know a, a sort of very weighty player in 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 washington in apple and broadcom and qualcomm um which maybe sort of starting to say different things behind um uh, behind closed doors, uh, not necessarily wanting, uh, you know, NVIDIA as well, um, not necessarily wanting uh, Chinese domestic uh, uh, competitors to be able to really um, uh, spread their wings. It, it goes back to the jigsaw puzzle analogy that you made earlier, right? Which is, uh, if you only remove one piece of the jigsaw puzzle, China will replace that piece of the jigsaw puzzle. So you can't remove NVIDIA supply, right? Alone. Um, you can't just remove, you know, uh, one aspect of semiconductor equipment because they'll be able to figure that out, right? You can't just remove one one type of chip because they'll be able to figure that out. Um, and and that's what you know is what worries Nvidia and and all these other companies is hey if you remove my piece of the jigsaw puzzle they're going to figure it out they're going to sell it and then they're going to start expanding internationally too. Um, and you know that's just bad for me long term. But if you know the, the sort of the you know the policymakers need to decide do they want a you know a, a very a rising chinese industry because it's going to happen now the cat's already out of the bag the intentions are clear they want to insource every product right and that's been the intention and the stated policy goal uh even before the october 7th restrictions right read made in china 2020 um made in china 2025 those those goals were very clear the money was being invested um and the only thing that these sanctions have done is maybe accelerate it slightly uh the ineffective sanctions right so the the policymakers need to decide do we just kind of give up or do we go, you know, much harder on the sanctions and actually have effective sanctions that work? Um, so it's sort of the the question, um, because if you do nothing, you know, the cat's already in the bag. Uh, NVIDIA will have competitors in 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 Huawei and Madex and in Byron and, uh, you know, in Alibaba, Tencent's in-house chips. Right. Uh, so so they, they kind of have to decide, do they do they want to you know give up entirely on on the current goals or, you know, actually try and enforce sort of, you know, banning of AI for war. I think that sort of jigsaw puzzle analogy also works for, from a political economy standpoint, because, you know, if you only take off sort of like one or two uh, uh, companies or slices in the supply chain, then kind of everyone else still wants to keep the party going. Um, and, you know, this is the same thing even with ASML, where like they cut off one of their business lines, but their other business line went gangbusters, like partially because of the... Um, uh, uh, because of the export controls, where where all of this sort of like DUV demand um, shot up over the past um, uh, over the past few years, um, but if you have a more comprehensive approach where it just like becomes very clear that um, no one is going to be able to bring in um, tools and equipment, which actually ends up getting used for um, uh, um, you know for for, for leading edge, um, then that kind of dynamic shifts. People get the message, and you don't necessarily have. Um, you know, uh, Intel running to, uh, you know, Pat Gelsinger going to China and saying, you know, we want to build AI chips in, in the PRC and, and, and Jensen Huang uh, spending a lot of time on, um, uh, on news talking about, you know, it's a real problem for the U.S. if we're, we're not able to, to export into China. I feel like over and over and over, we've underestimated China's um, political gumption and focus and uh, effort on essentially getting off the Western supply chain. They did this, you know, 20 years ago with the internet, right? And they've, you know, clearly there's an entire separate system. Um, and I think that this maybe is another example where we're starting to still underestimate China's ability and willingness to move forward without the United States and the willingness to consistently skirt uh, the export controls uh, and, and, and walk through every single loophole with or without. You know, I, I feel like 
the 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 United States put forward this thing with a kind of like a bowl. It was like a you know it was like a like a framework, and then China was like great and just poked holes as many as holes as they could in the framework, continued onward, and um, I still feel like it's an underestimation. And um, something that I've also been really kind of shocked and surprised with is the apology uh, aspect of it's like, well, it's not a five nanometer TSMC phone, but I, I just think that people cannot appreciate how much of a technological accomplishment it's been, right? Um, getting to seven nanometer, this this node that truly uh, gave Intel a huge headache for years and years and years. Look, all of a sudden, SMIC is right there, um, designing all this stuff with like it, allegedly some of the the EDA tools, like like uh, designing a harder process too. SMIC, uh, SMIC is probably a harder PDK, a whole a whole process of problems just to design a chip. And they made one just as good as the West would be in 2020. So I think that um, if everything, you know, if we had no export controls, we would be talking about a company that would probably be close to the leading edge right now, in my opinion. I don't know about you, Dylan, uh, but for example, if SMIC had an EV tool, I think we would be very shocked with where they 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 are at, right? Um, and I think that uh, if there wasn't export controls, we would be having a totally different com- conversation that would be like a lot more scary, that would really have people riled up. And I think that um, people are kind of missing it by like, you know, just comparing benchmarks and saying, oh, it's an old phone. It's an old phone that they managed to make uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of uh, like block blockades or like uh, friction put up for them not to do it. And they managed to do it anyways. Dylan, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue some of the restrictions are, you know, superficial and, and in name only. But besides that, right, I mean, the, the engineering that they've done is amazing, right? Like. The, the, like I mentioned earlier, right? Custom CPU, custom GPU, uh, class leading modem, right? On a process technology that is only a few years behind. Uh, you know, the design is probably is, is less than a few years behind, right? The the, the capabilities are just amazing, right? Um, you know, it's not something to scoff at, right? It's not something to dismiss. Oh well, Apple is faster. Oh well, Qualcomm's faster. Yeah, but folks, we were talking about a decade behind. Now we're talking. Well, then we we're talking about five years behind. Now we're talking about two years behind, right? Um, You know, in a blink of an eye, it could be, you know, on par or ahead, right? EVs, they are ahead, right? Um, You know, it's like, it's like, well, you know, for a long time, Chinese EV industry was called like, oh, they're not as good as Tesla, whatever, right? Well, they're clearly better than Ford and GM and and Volkswagen. um, And, and, you know, you could argue they're better than uh, Tesla today, right? Um, You know, so, so I think there's many aspects where it's, you know, the sort of dismissiveness is uh, counterproductive. a counterproductive part of the discussion. Yeah. So I want to sort of stay on the, like the forward looking aspect of this, you know, so some have argued that like, look, DUV, you can push it to seven, maybe you can push it to five, but like at a certain point, you'll kind of like max out on what you can do with this, um, uh, with, with this sort of like type, type of lithography. And, and, and on the other hand, you know, you'll have Samsung and, and, and TSMC and Intel being able to, um, you know, get to two nanometer and beyond with, you know, God knows, God knows what crazy uh, backside power and packaging and what have you. If if nothing else changes and and all China is still restricted from, you know, come 2025, 2026 is just not having UV tools like what will that gap end up expanding or um, or or sort of staying constant um, based on sort of where we where we are today? So certain gaps, right, like process technology, right, I think SMIC could get to five. Uh, you know, yield would be worse because they're using DUV, but five is technically possible with DUV. Um, you know, but they they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to race all the way ahead on you know maybe where where you know Samsung and Intel and TSMC are talking about two nanometer in that time frame, right? We'll see who can actually achieve it, but you know that's that's one aspect where they will remain behind. But there's other places where disruptive innovation can happen, and there's no limits, right? So advanced packaging with things like hybrid bonding um, would very much narrow the field. Right. You know, maybe it's not a two nanometer, maybe it's maybe it's multiple five nanometer chips that are stacked on top of each other very closely. Right. Or, you know, in, in some ways or it's co-package optics. Right. You know, uh, you know, Doug mentioned earlier, but China has the largest optics manufacturer in a light in the world. Um, they're, they're leading in in fiber manufacturing. They're leading in laser manufacturing. Uh, you know, there, there's no reason they can't do advanced packaging to stick optics right next to the chip and connect many, many five nanometer chips together. Uh, at very high bandwidth, right? So it looks like one chip uh, on paper, whereas, you know, maybe the Western uh, firms didn't focus on that line of innovation as hard. 
Um, and so while they might have a slightly more optimal solution uh, in, you know, you know, and maybe China has to deal with maybe more chips to achieve the same performance, the cost is not that much higher uh, and the performance is not worse. Right. Um, you know, so sort of there's other ways to innovate that aren't even being limited at all. And, you know, to focus on, hey, lithography is the only important thing and it's the only limiting factor for for progress is, is kind of ridiculous. Right. Um, so so, you know, I, I think the gap would narrow further. Um, and there would be ways where they're ahead. Uh, and in fact, there are already ways where it's ahead uh, for China where uh, limitations aren't being put in, right? Like edge AI, right? Which is AI processing on the edge, right right where the user is, right where the data is being generated. They've done a lot of interesting things with compute and memory and analog and so on and so forth that make their processing on the edge better, right? Uh, same with, you know, with cameras, smart cameras that detect people's faces. They destroy the West in creating things like that, right? Um, so, so you know, just to just to focus on EUV lithography is a is a poor output. Can I can I uh, I want to keep going on this point because I think EUV lithography is fighting the last war. But in the semiconductor industry, uh, what is going past Moore's law is going to be something called DTCO, meaning design technology co optimization. Essentially, it's trying to think of smarter ways to solve the problem that isn't completely uh, defined by shrink, which is how it historically was. Uh, a good example is Intel pursuing backside power. Backside power, for example, 100% uh, is not restricted in its current form, right? And that is a huge technology inflection that is already happening, will happen, and China has a, as much ability to do that as anyone else does. Um, advanced packaging. So, for example, like, imagine some very clever backside, you know, it, it, backside power design co-optimization that yes, it's using EUV, but, or no, DUV instead of EUV, but we are essentially getting a transistor density because it's like, you know, because it's a much further um, aggressive, I, for, I forget what the name of it is, like, it's not BPR, it's not, uh, like a much more aggressive version of backside is being applied and um, it's co-packaged in a way that effectively gets you uh, a, a completely leading edge chip but while completely skirting all the EV tools, that is a hundred percent possible in the five year in five years from now, given how the technology roadmap is like kind of going. And I think that there isn't just that like that forward thinking of where the ball is going to. Instead, it's look constant looking back at where the ball was. And I think that that's kind of where we are missing the point. Yeah, I mean, this is this is sort of like what I learned from hanging out with you guys in Taiwan all week. Um, and, 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 and in Semicon, and I think just like Washington, it, like figuring out anything about technology is very difficult. And it under like the, the sort of gears of government um, understood lithography and they understood the 14, 7, 5, 3 nanometer concept. And that seemed and it was only one company. Right. So it was like a relatively straightforward thing to sort of like get your, um, uh, you know, get your tentacles around and, and, and squeeze. But. This sort of like post Moore's law universe where there are many different potential, um, you know, candidates in the running for being, and it's will probably be a mix of all these different things you guys listed of what's going to sort of bring us more, um, uh, uh, more performance in the coming years. Um, does it, isn't, isn't predicated on having, uh, uh, UV and, uh, so, so that, this, that, that you can't just assume that without these ASML tools. Um, you know, w w without the ES EUV ASML tools, like China will never be able to compete the um uh, at the leading edge with um uh with the rest of the global players, and that's something that I think uh sort of Western uh policymakers really need to sort of internal understand and internalize and respect um as they're thinking about what is uh you know what's going to happen next when it comes to export control. Yeah. So let's come back to um uh, uh, high bandwidth memory. So what is it? Why is it so important? And why is it so hard to manufacture? So high bandwidth memory is sort of a different story than the rest of this commodity memory, right? Because commodity memory is you make a wafer, it's chips with memory on it, you cut them up, you test them, you send them out, right? You package them, that's it. With high bandwidth memory, uh, Samsung, SK Hynix, uh, Micron, uh, they have to do something very different, which is, hey, they, yeah, they made a wafer, but then they stack uh, memory on top of each other for many layers, right? The most leading edge uh, stuff today is 12 layers. Right. And in fact, if you look at every, you know, all the advanced NVIDIA GPUs, the H100 uh, with HBM3 memory, 100% of that comes from SK Hynix because Samsung and Micron can't even make it yet. Right. They're trying. They're trying to get in there. There's rumors they're going to get into the supply chain, but th it's, it's very single source today. Right. Just like they buy all their, uh, you know, compute chips from uh, TSMC, 
they buy all their memory from SK Hynix for the H100 GPU that's sort of lighting the world on fire. Um, so when you talk about, you know, high bandwidth memory, it's a pretty complex process, right? So you kind of need, you know, to be able to manufacture memory, but you also need to be able to stack it on top of each other. Now, the problem with sanctions for this is that the equipment required to stack it on top of each other is, uh, you know, while some of it is American, uh, you know, LAM Research has a pretty big foothold there. Applied has some uh, materials. Uh, a lot of it is actually, uh, you know, there's a Korean company, there's a Taiwanese company, uh, you know, there's there's ASM Pacific, which used to be a European company, but now is, uh, you know, their headquarters, they're, they're listed on the Hong Kong exchange. Uh, you know, the, the, there's companies like this that are really integral to the supply chain there on an equipment basis. The other thing is SK Hynix, who is the one who produces all the memory for NVIDIA, uh, has a humongous DRAM fab in uh, Wuxi, is it Wuxi, China? And so, you know, the question is, well, okay, if they're banned, can, can I mean, yes, they don't specifically make that HBM there, uh, but the steps to get to HBM are not insurmountable, right? Um, you know, yes, it would probably be another, you know, one year delay, maybe, uh, you know, it would hurt capacity, but China would be able to, you know, it's a, it's a surmountable thing, right? You can't just target one thing and say, hey, that's it. And they also had a, probably the largest installed base of TCB and wire bonders in the world. Like they're like, I, I think even if we were to cut it off, like some of the the abilities to do that, that the cat's out of the, right? Like, I just can't imagine that, like, even if we tried, like, they already have such a large installed base. It's kind of like they will figure that one out eventually. Just, you know, what I was thinking. In your post, Dylan, you had a list of, uh, you, you got up to 20 um, different potential things that could be uh, squeezed. But what are what are one or two that strike out to you as like um, uh, potentially uh, uh, relatively straightforward and effective to implement? There are a range of things that the U.S. could do to completely you know stop the semiconductor industry in China. Now, of course, I think some of these options would probably return with like China saying, hey, no more rare earth minerals or like no more penicillin. And that would cause complete pandemonium. Uh, but there are a range of like possibilities of things to do, right? You know, you know, banning, you know, immersion lithography tools, uh, where which which you know ASML absolutely does require USIP to do, uh, even though they claim that there is no USIP. Uh, you know, the reticle manu engineering, the mask engineering, or the reticle engineering, the OPC engineering, the source engineering. A lot of that is in the US. Um, you know, they could stop the servicing of equipment, right? Uh, right now that's not being really limited. They could stop photoresist, which is a chemical input that you need to do lithography, right? Uh, and that's completely in, in Japan, right? They could limit masks and mask blanks and metrology equipment. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of like different arsenals of uh, things to be done. Uh, the only thing I would, and I, I wrote a list of 20 different possible ones, uh, which if all done would probably just cause a war and, but also the semiconductor industry would be stopped in China, uh, but they'd probably like, you know, ban penicillin, as I said, or something crazy. Right. Um, but, you know, there is a range of possibilities. Right. Um, and and, you know, the, the one thing I want to highlight is like if you just limit one thing. Right. If you focus on lithography, well, they'll turn and, and direct their attention to advanced packaging and hybrid bonding and backside power delivery and and uh, optics. Right. And if you ban advanced packaging, then they'll focus on optics and and many other things. Right. Uh, you know, so you have to kind of uh, you know, go through the arsenal of things, right? Uh, that, you know, if you ban, if you say chips, AI chips can only have a certain amount of uh, performance and chip to chip IO, then they'll say, okay, we'll, we'll make chip to chip IO way higher and we'll keep we'll just fan out lower. We'll just fan out, right? Like that's, that's the, that's the response. We'll just make a bigger parallel. So, so essentially like, I think that Dylan's completely right in terms of how we've been trying to find a single hole. And then what happens is the entire ecosystem will optimize around that hole over and over and over. And I think what realistically for things to stop is you have to do a few of the big ones, the, a few of the big ones back to back to back uh, in order to stop things. I think hybrid bonding to me is really interesting, at least in terms of like, I don't think it's going to stop any kind of near term stuff. I think TCB is probably out of the bag in China already, if that makes sense. Um, I think hybrid bonding is some place where we can stop something in flight today. Um, that's a good example of, of on, on top of HBM. So there, there's a lot of different places that uh, that this the 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 export could like further export restrictions could stop things but it has to be very well thought out and it has to be a little bit more um in concert with each other if that makes sense instead of just doing you know another an, some other thing for example hbm and then they'll find some kind of work around there it's it just it needs to be multi multi 
multifaceted and probably all at the same time. So, you know, I think the the sort of, you know, not starting World War Three, not bricking every single fab in China, um, but sort of focusing on the on the leading edge um, and making sure that sort of like the, the Western tool ecosystem um, uh, doesn't necessarily support this. I think this sort of this sort of like tool equipment and like you know, the, the, the sort of tool upkeep seems to me to be like a relatively straightforward one where you have sort of more focused enforcement on that and like sort of know your customer stuff or like know your fab line of, of, of you know, what your tools are, are being used for. Because if you're really not supposed to be doing this stuff, um, uh, you know, clearly there's, there's a lot of Western, a lot of Western uh, IP, a lot of Western equipment, which is making this, um, uh, making this uh, seven nanometer chip. And if, if the U.S. decides that this is not something that we can feel safe and be comfortable happening in China, that seems to me to be a relatively straightforward thing to sort of roll back the um, uh, um, the progress that, that has already been made. Doug and Dylan, thanks so much for being part of the channel.